we shall be talking about foreign investment flows in India. Economic liberalization and globalization have paved the way for greater investment flows between countries in general. And this in turn has substantially increased the role of international investments in trade, global production across borders, then the generation of employment across borders and so on. The tremendous growth in such flows across borders has led to a great amount of economic growth across countries in the entire world. After studying this module, you would be able to know about the various types of capital flows, understand the difference between FDI and FPI, evaluate the benefits and costs of foreign direct investment, understand about uh, various types of FDI and uh, know about the global trends in FDI. We shall now discuss all types of investment flows. Uh, foreign investment involves the flow of capital from one economy to another in barter for crucial ownership stakes in a domestic company or in any other form of domestic investment or assets. Broadly speaking, there are two types of foreign investment namely foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment. Very often we refer to foreign portfolio investment loosely as foreign institutional investors FIIs. So, if we look at this division then the total flow of foreign investments are divided into foreign direct investments and foreign portfolio investments. We shall now be talking about foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment is defined as cross border investment in which one entity from one economy invests in another economy and this is done with a view to getting a lasting interest and control over the other entity which is created in another economy. So, this type of investment helps the home country that is the source of foreign direct investment to acquire the control and ownership of a firm which exists or which is set up in the target country that is known as the host country. In general, it takes the form of uh, acquiring an existing firm or it could also be in the form of creating a new entity. So, the entity could be in the uh, organizational form of being either a branch or a subsidiary and it is meant for expanding the operations of an existing enterprise which actually belongs to the home country or the source from where the investment comes. So, now the FDI facilitates along with it investment just does not come alone. Along with FDI comes transfer of technology, know-how, skills, expertise and management and other resources. And these resources are also helpful, they facilitate the growth and development of the host country that is the country into which the foreign direct flows are coming. Uh, so, we can see that the nature of foreign direct investment is different from uh, what we have called foreign portfolio investment. FDI can be carried out by individuals as well as enterprises. Now, FDI cannot be easily liquidated that is one of the features. Therefore, it is governed by a number of considerations like economic prospect, trade policy, market size, functioning 
and efficiency of the local markets, availability of human capital and then the restrictions on repatriation of the earnings that are received by the parent company from the subsidiary which has been set up in the host country. FDI has always been linked uh, to the improvement in economic growth and development in the host countries. And this has led to the evolution of global competition. So, different countries because they perceive that FDI is going to come into their country and it is going to improve conditions in that country, they compete with each other for attracting FDI. Many countries are now furnishing a wide spectrum of incentives to the foreign investors like tariff concessions, tax holidays, R&D support, infrastructure, improvements in uh, you know all kinds of infrastructure both financial and physical infrastructure. Then financial subsidies are also being provided, low tax rates and uh, as has been mentioned uh, other tax incentives are also being provided. Now we shall be considering foreign portfolio investment. As has been mentioned foreign portfolio investment is purely in the nature of a financial flow. It is uh, not really in the nature of what we call relocation, international relocation of production. So, if we were to consider FDI then uh, appropriate description of FDI in technical terms would be international relocation of production. That means production which was taking place in the home country is now transferred to another country which is the host country. As opposed to this in the case of foreign portfolio investment it is only the flow of funds, it is only the flow of investments. Foreign portfolio investment involves investment in foreign assets such as stocks, bonds etc. And the type of investment is not made with the intention of acquiring a long term control. In fact, the uh, firm that invests in uh, uh, through uh, FII or through foreign portfolio investment usually does it across many firms. It, is, it does not invest in one single firm whereas FDI is something which is invested in a particular firm. Uh, typically this type of investment that is foreign portfolio investment is short term in nature and it is made to take advantage of the favorable exchange rate conditions and of the varying conditions in the stock markets. So, basically the purpose of foreign portfolio investment is to get short term capital gains. It provides the investor with an opportunity also as I said that foreign portfolio investment is invested in many different firms and therefore it is not one single firm in which the foreign investment goes. So, what is the purpose? The purpose is that foreign portfolio investment as the name suggests portfolio is meant for diversification. So, the investor which who is investing from the home country is also conscious that because there is a risk involved while investing in a foreign country therefore, they are interested in holding a portfolio of different companies. The foreign portfolio investment can also strengthen the domestic capital markets by increasing the liquidity. Liquidity is the availability of capital funds and can also contribute to improving the functioning of the economy. Once there is a foreign portfolio investment then the foreign entities would be very conscious that when there are certain companies in which they have invested they would try to ensure that those companies function well. Foreign portfolio investment can also help 
to strengthen the domestic capital market by enhancing liquidity. Liquidity is the availability of investable funds, the availability of capital. In turn, what would happen is that if the capital markets are functioning better, then there would be an optimal allocation of capital and resources in the domestic economy. For an emerging economy, for a growing economy, foreign portfolio investment can prove to be a significant contributor to its development by creating a portfolio effect that is a investment across different companies would lead to better and optimal allocation of resources and this would increase the efficiency of the capital market. It would also lead to an increase a significant increase in the wealth that is being generated. Foreign portfolio investment is also referred to as hot money because this happens when money or investable funds which are lying in the home country find that there is an attractive proposition in the host country then these hot flow of money flows into the uh, host countries. We shall now examine the difference or compare FDI and foreign portfolio investment. Although both FDI and FPI are much needed in the form of capital for a country and they actually give rise to or fuel the process of economic development, yet there are very vital differences between the two forms of investment. Some of them let us examine and discuss. Uh, FDI is long term investment, it is investment in real capital or physical assets like plant, equipment, factories, buildings, infrastructure and so on. Whereas FII is short term investment in financial assets such as bonds, stocks, etc which are denominated in terms of the currency of the issuing company of the domestic economy or the host economy. FDI is made with the intention of acquiring controlling rights or interests in the management of the newly created foreign enterprise on the soil of the domestic economy. Whereas investors making portfolio investments do not actually have any interest in the management or control. Their purpose is to make quick and short term capital gains. This they do by buying and selling frequently the shares of a company or many companies in the host country. It is difficult for a company which has invested in uh, FDI to suddenly pull out, sell their interest in the firm and uh, go out of the country. But whereas in the case of portfolio investment, there is an ease, it is very easy for them to sell out their shares and go and invest maybe in a different company or maybe invest in some other country as well. So therefore, as, as soon as the environment in the stock market does not favor foreign portfolio investment at a drop of the hat so to say they will run away from the country. Now this leads to a situation where the uh, it leads to a lot of volatility in the stock markets of the host country. Therefore, this is one negative feature of foreign portfolio investment. We shall now analyze the costs and benefits or the advantages and uh, disadvantages of FDI. When FDI flows from one country to the other, it creates uh, lots of benefits uh, which flow from the home country to the host country. But as well as, uh, as much as the advantages there are also some disadvantages. First of all, let us consider the benefits or advantages. 
the benefits to the home country are first of all the repatriation of income in terms of foreign exchange improves the country's balance of payments. FDI may lead to the import of raw materials or intermediate goods from the home country for the production which would further lead to employment generation. The home country also benefits in terms of acquiring knowledge and skills from operating abroad. Cost to the home country. The outflow of factors of production like skilled manpower, professionals, experts and capital can hinder the growth of the home country. The balance of payments account of the home country could also suffer in terms of uh, three things, initial capital outflow and uh, secondly if the multinational enterprise invests abroad then to take advantage of the low cost and uh, the preferred location the, and then if it sells back the goods produced in the foreign location to the home country then this would also lead to an increase in the home country's imports. Thirdly, if uh, foreign operations result in the substitution of domestic exports then the decrease in home country's exports will again adversely affect the balance of payments of the home country. Now, if the multinational enterprise decides to conduct foreign operations with the intention of shutting down the home country's operations, then the home country will suffer in terms of unemployment. So, these are some of the effects on the home country, the negative effects. Now, let us see the benefits to the host country. FDI brings in the stock of capital, advanced technology, management skills and expertise to the host economy. Thereby, it speeds up the pace of economic growth and development in the uh, host country. Moreover, the host economy also gains an access to the continued R&D of the home country. FDI also helps to generate employment opportunities in the host country. The employment of labor force uh, uh, due to multinationals results in an increase not only in the level of employment but also in terms of the level of income and once the incomes of the residents of the host country increases, the income increases in the host country then automatically this also leads to an increase in demand. This uh, in turn helps to create more jobs as well. Therefore, we see that there are many benefits to the host country. Multinationals also train the labor force which helps to create a pool of trained personnel in the host economy. The inflow of capital helps to improve the host country's balance of payments and at the same time if FDI can also improve the balance of payments, it results in the reduction of imports and on the other hand leads to export promotion. FDI also results in the availability of a large variety of goods produced at a lower price thereby increasing consumer welfare. It also leads to the creation of more of competition in the business environment of the host country which of course is not always bad competition is good for the host economy. Now let us see what are the negative effects of FDI on the host country that is what is the cost to the host country. Foreign investment can result in a deterioration in the country's balance of payments on account of repatriation of profits by the 
MNCs from the host country back to the home country. Payment of dividends, interest, royalty payments, technical fees, these are all outgoes for the host country. If the operations require more of imported raw materials from the home country, then this would also go against the balance of payments. It would create a negative balance of payments with respect to the host country. Multinational enterprises are rather large sized enterprises because of which what happens is large and you know huge economic power is vested with the multinational enterprises. They have access to greater financial resources and they control some of the financial institutions of the host country. In fact, one of the implications of being very large in size is that they could actually stifle, they could destroy the competition within the host economy. They could in fact eliminate the local producers and this would certainly hamper the growth of native industries. The domestic entrepreneurs would suffer. With the operations of multinationals spread accord, across large number of countries and because they have an effective supply chain, they are able to reap economies of scale. These economies of scale cannot be competed with by the local producers. Therefore, the local producers in the host economy are at a loss in comparison to the multinational enterprises. If the multinational enterprise is able to monopolize the market by virtue of their size and monopoly power, then they could also charge a higher price for their products. This would not only stifle the competition, but also it would hamper the interests of consumers. FDI also results in an increased economic interdependence between the home country and the host country. This may lead to the reduction of the degree of control that host governments exert over their own economies. Therefore, the domestic governments also would lose out in the process. We shall now discuss the types of FDI. FDI can be classified into four broad categories which are the following. First of all, we have a classification of FDI by direction that is on the basis of direction of flow of funds, FDI can be classified in terms of inward FDI. Inward FDI takes place when foreign capital flows from the home country to the host country. It is basically an investment of foreign capital uh, in the local resources of the host country by the residents of the home country. Outward FDI is FDI which flows out from the economy where local capital is invested in foreign resources. And then we could have a classification of FDI on the basis of target. On the basis of target, FDI can be classified into two types of investment, horizontal FDI this type of FDI involves manufacturing the same product or service in a host country as the firms do in the home country. For example, Ford may be investing in India, manufacture of cars to serve the Indian market and this is an example of horizontal FDI. On the other hand, vertical FDI is investment in upstream and downstream operations and this is referred to vertical FDI. Within 
uh, vertical FDI we have two types of investments. If there are backward integration then this is called backward vertical FDI where the multinational enterprise invests in the host country by absorbing some production unit of intermediate goods or inputs for its own domestic operations in the home country. It, this is referred to backward vertical FDI. For example, if in United States there is an automobile company like Ford and it acquires a tire manufacturer or a steel manufacturing unit in uh, let us say in Japan or in Korea then this would be typically a case of backward vertical FDI and this also happens very often in the case of extractive industry such as petroleum and minerals like Australia has got vast uh, mineral resources and if there is a manufacturing unit in USA which takes over the mines in Australia this would typically be a case of vertical in integration, vertical uh, FDI through backward integration. Then we have forward vertical FDI when a multinational invests in a foreign market to uh, for production for the home made products and this is known as forward vertical integration. Once again suppose there is uh, an automobile manufacturer who manufactures most of the, uh, uh, the car in terms of its assembly of its parts and so on, but has originally handed over the marketing or the sales part to some other company. But in its own interest it is possible that this automobile company let us say something like Chevrolet it uh, had given out its uh, sale and marketing and distribution channel to some other company somewhere in the in Europe. Now if the US company Chevrolet takes over the operations of the sale and distribution in Europe then this would be a case of forward integration. Now after forward vertical FDI we have another way of classifying FDI that is by motive. So there are various types of motives for FDI and these can be categorized into four types. Uh, resource seeking FDI. When investment is made in, in a foreign location to take advantage of natural resources like mineral uh, resources, other uh, extractive industry, cheap labor or other assets which are peculiar to the host country then investment is said to be resource seeking. Normally what happens is that the home country does not have these kinds of resources. Usually this happens in the case of raw materials. Usually this type of investment is made to acquire resources that are either not available or are available at a very high cost in the home country and also it could be that the quality of the raw material which is available in the home country is not adequate and therefore the home country firm goes to the host country to obtain such resources. Sometimes this is also done for promotion of exports. Uh, Exxon Mobil invests in Middle East countries like Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Abu Dhabi uh, obviously this is because the raw material which is crude petroleum is not available let us say in United States. So the processed uh, 
petroleum and other products will be extracted from this raw material. Now in such a case basically if some such oil well which is there in Abu Dhabi is uh, taken over by Exxon Mobil then this would clearly be a case of FDI for the sake of resources, resource seeking FDI. Now we have another category of FDI called market seeking FDI. Market seeking FDI engulfs the investing economy that is the host economy in order to directly receive the market with local in order to directly serve the market with local production and distribution rather than through exporting. The basic motive behind this type of FDI is to circumvent the trade barriers of the host economy so as to gain access to large overseas market and to reap the benefits of economies of scale. Usually this type of investment is made in countries where customer base is large, the per capita income is high and therefore market seeking FDI displaces exports from the home country. This is a substitution of export from home country with FDI into the host country. For example, General Motors invests in India to offer products under its Chevrolet brand and this is an example of market seeking investment, market seeking FDI. So FDI is in demand not just because of capital but because there is a market which is demanding the products. So therefore this is the basis of market seeking FDI, there is an exploitation of large markets by the home country through its FDI. Then we have something called efficiency seeking FDI. Efficiency seeking FDI indicates that foreign capital flows come from the home country to the host country in search of more efficient processes of production that is cost effective and low cost processes of production. For example, if there is a labor intensive process then a foreign firm may invest in a firm in the domestic economy let us say India where labor is cheap. So it would be more efficient to produce uh, such a uh, product in India because the product itself may be labor intensive. The main motive behind this type of investment is to take advantage of the differences in institutional arrangements, market structure, cost differences between the locations and quality of infrastructure. China for example is able to attract a lot of manufacturing from USA. Primary reason is that it has got good infrastructure, it has got human capital and it has a large market as well. So all of these reasons lead to a more efficient system of production. The products are produced at a relatively low cost and this type of FDI is also likely to therefore uh, promote exports from the host country. However, exports from the host country if they are done through the multinational which has been relocated in the host country would actually be a benefit to the home country itself. Uh, then there is something known as strategic asset seeking FDI. This type of investment involves investing in a foreign country to acquire strategic assets uh, like innovative technology, management expertise in order to strengthen the firm's global competitiveness. This type of FDI results in the multinational acquiring local firms for forming strategic alliances 
with local firms in the host country. Now we are coming to another aspect of FDI that is it is interesting to note how a foreign firm enters the host market. Now this we are therefore talking about mode of entry. So therefore this is another way of classifying FDI by mode of entry. On the basis of mode of entry FDI can be classified into two types of investment. Greenfield investment is that type of investment whereby a entirely new wholly owned operation or facility is set up uh, from scratch in the host economy by the home country. So greenfield investment helps to generate new jobs, it helps to generate uh, investment, it helps to boost the productive capacity of the host nation and this is why most nations offer uh, benefits some kind of incentives in the form of tax holidays, subsidies etc. because they want to attract FDI into such greenfield investment. This type of investment enables the investor to exert a greater degree of control over all aspects of business. Now let us take up an example. A German luxury car maker, let us say Mercedes Benz, starts its own manufacturing plant in Pune and launches the product in India. Now this has been done what is called de novo, right from the beginning, right from scratch. So therefore this is an example of greenfield investment. On the other hand, through mergers and acquisitions, a foreign investment can take over an existing firm in the host economy and this is known as brownfield investment. You would see the comparison green is something new and brown is something old. So mergers across borders take place by which the ownership of an existing business entity is transferred from the hands of the host economy to the home country and the assets are all now in the hands of the firm which has taken over the host country firm. And therefore now what happens is that once it has taken over this uh, host country firm then it forms a new entity, it is no longer the same old legal en entity. So this is the case where there is a merger. Similarly, we could have acquisition. Acquisition is sup uh, supposed to take place when the control of the local or the host firm's assets, assets and liabilities and operations are lock, stock and barrel, they are transferred to the foreign firm. As a result, the foreign, the domestic or the host country firm becomes an affiliate of the foreign firm. So acquisition is outright but sometimes acquisition could either be through hostile means that is without the wish and concurrence of the host country firm or it could also be by virtue of some agreement, cooperation and this could be a friendly takeover. Uh, further acquisition can be either a minority acquisition which means the foreign firm, the home country firm owns 10 percent of the equity stake or it could own also up to 49 percent, a minimum of 10 percent and up to a 49 percent. This would be a minority acquisition, but a majority acquisition would mean that it is taking over more than 50 percent and even up to 100 percent which is an outright stake. In, in Dalco Industries, a subsidiary of the Aditya Birla group engaged in an aluminium manufacturing business acquired Canadian based firm called Novelis. 
Uh, now, there is a question. Why do firms tend to prefer mergers and acquisitions over greenfield investments? The benefits are 1. It is quicker to execute. 2. It provides ready access to local markets and know-how. It helps to eliminate potential competition. It provides access to local firms strategic assets like customer relationship, distribution and production systems and trademarks. These are some of the reasons that exist. Now, we shall be studying the uh, global trends in FDI. FDI has grown considerably in its importance and it has registered a phenomenal growth over the years. The composition of FDI has also undergone uh, several changes. Global trends in FDI inflows. Let us now examine these trends. Across the world, FDI has grown multifold. In the beginning, in 1970s, the order of FDI inflows was around 13 billion dollars only. By 1990, it grew up to over 200 billion dollars. Further, in 2010, it has now grown more than 1400 billion dollars. So, you could imagine how much FDI has grown. However, in 2012, the global FDI inflows actually fell by 18 percent from 1600 billion to 1350 billion. So, this of course, you can imagine is as a result of the global financial crisis. During 1970 to 1991, the FDI inflows were concentrated in a handful of developed countries like USA, Canada, UK and Japan. In 1974, the developed economies actually received 90 percent of the global FDI inflows. This trend has now slowly been changing with the developing economies accounting for 52 percent of the global FDI inflows. The absolute amount of FDI inflows going to developing economies has also shown a rising trend. For instance, it has increased from a mere 35 billion dollars in 1990 to over 700 billion dollars in 2012. Within the group of developing economies, the countries which are relatively developed have received the major chunk of FDI inflows. Very little FDI has gone to low income countries with the exception of India and China. Amongst the top 20 host economies in 2012, USA saw the biggest inflow of FDI amounting to 167 billion dollars. China bagged the second place, it received an inflow to the tune of 121 billion dollars. The three developing economies namely China, Hong Kong and Brazil ranked amongst the five largest recipients in the world. India was at the 15th position receiving an FDI inflow of around 26 billion dollars. China has been able to attract large FDI inflows because of its changed political environment. It has adopted the market economy and moreover it has got a large population and a large market size. So, coupled with a large market size and the new political environment, it has achieved a high growth both in terms of FDI inflows and as a consequence of that in terms of 
economic growth. It has been facing consistent economic growth for several years. In 2012, the absolute amount of FDI inflows to developed countries actually fell sharply. For instance, in United States, it fell from $227 billion to $168 billion. A similar trend is observed in the case of the European developed economies. However, with the improvement in the macroeconomic parameters, the FDI inflows are expected to show a rising trend in the years to come. Now, let us look at the global trends in FDI outflows. The global FDI outflows have also grown over the years starting from a mere 14 billion dollars in 1970 and it increased then to 234 billion dollars in 1990. Further, it increased to more than 2200 billion dollars in 2007. But as we are aware, in 2007 there was the global financial crisis, then gradually it started declining and gradually it reached 1500 billion dollars in 2010. In 2012, the figure stood at 1390 billion down from 1678 billion in 2011, which was a drastic fall of 17 percent. From 1970 up to 1990, developed economies accounted for more than 90 percent of the global FDI outflows. For instance, in 1970, 99.6 percent of the global FDI outflows were from developed economies. This trend has undergone some change since 1990. In, in 2012, developing economies accounted for 31 percent of the global FDI outflows. This trend indicates that developing economies are now emerging as major investors across the world. While in the FDI outflows from developing economies went up slightly from 422 billion in 2011 to 426 billion in 2012, the situation was reversed for developed economies. The FDI outflows from developed economies went down from 1183 billion in 2011 to 909 billion in 2012. This shows a change in the basic trend of global financial flows across the world. Amongst the developing world, Asian countries accounted for three-fourth of the FDI outflows from developing economies. The major chunk of FDI outflows amongst the Asian countries has been from China. FDI outflows from some of the developing economies like Thailand, Malaysia, Turkey and the Republic of Korea actually rose in 2012. On the other hand, FDI outflows from India, Hong Kong and Singapore declined in 2012 and USA again accounted for the largest FDI outflows in 2012 followed by Japan, China emerged as the world's third largest investor followed by Hong Kong. We shall now recapitulate what we have learnt so far. This is in the nature of a summary. Foreign investment involves the flow of capital from one economy to another. This is done with a view to acquire a significant stake in the ownership of the domestic companies which are set up in the host economy that is the foreign investment flows come from the 
home economy which in most cases to begin with at the beginning of the 20th century were almost exclusively the developed countries of the world. Two types of foreign investment flows occur, one is known as foreign direct investment and the other is known as foreign portfolio investment. Foreign direct investment is defined as cross border investment which an entity is made in one economy in an enterprise by the residents of another economy. To be more specific, we could say that foreign direct investment is investment made by the residents of the home economy in an economy other than itself which is called the host economy and this investment is done with a view to gain long term control over the firm which is located in the host economy. Foreign portfolio investment is investment in a variety of financial assets. These financial assets could be stocks, shares, bonds and so on. And here the intention is not to have a controlling interest in the company in whose shares are being bought. Although both FDI and FPI bring capital into the economy, but there are differences between the two. For instance, volatility is one feature of FPI because FPI is constantly changing in its composition because FPI is constantly buying and selling of shares of different companies. This leads to volatility although we must say it also leads to liquidity. The benefits of FDI to the home country include better balance of payments, better employment generation, acquiring of knowledge and skills, but the cost to the home country involve outflow of factors of production, adverse effect possibly on the balance of payments due to the initial capital outflow. It also leads to a substitution of exports. The benefits to the host country include the supply of capital, the availability of advanced technologies, management skills and methods and moreover even the improvement in balance of payments. It is also likely to lead to better employment and opportunities for the local uh, workforce. It is sometimes also felt that the consumer welfare may be better because of the availability of a large variety of goods at affordable prices. The cost of FDI to the host country includes an adverse impact on the balance of payments due to the repatriation of profits. It also might lead to a situation where there is a destruction of competition within the domestic economy that is the host economy. FDI can be categorized in terms of inward and outward FDI, in terms of horizontal and vertical FDI, then in terms of the motives of FDI which are resource seeking, market seeking, efficiency seeking and strategic asset seeking FDI. On the basis of the mode of entry also, we can distinguish between greenfield and brownfield FDI. The global trends in FDI have shown a rising trend up to 2012 and it shows that United States uh, was the largest uh, uh, you know the supporter of FDI, it was responsible for the maximum inflows of FDI and the three developing economies which figure in the top list are China, Hong Kong and Brazil. And in terms of the FDI outflows also there has been 
a large growth in the FDI outflows. Again, USA accounts for the largest outflow in 2012, followed by Japan, China and Hong Kong.